When I was six, we were living in Zimbabwe and we came down on a holiday to a place called Londili near Mtata. And it took us four days to drive down to the beach, six of us in the car with our luggage on the roof. And when we were getting near the beach, Dad said, you can see the blue line in the distance. And we thought, ooh, what's this? And then we got to the sea and we ran down and we jumped in the waves. It was so exciting. And this was coming from a landlocked country. And you people living in Cape Town, you're less than 20 kilometers from the sea in virtually any place here in the Western Cape. And how much do you and the kids get to see this wonderful ocean that we've got? And I was just thinking the other day I saw that Cape Town had been voted the most beautiful city in the world. And uh, there's also been a competition to see which, ca which cities have got the most diversity of species. And Cape Town has come in with that as well. So we are living in an unbelievably rich, beautiful city. And it's important that the next generation are seeing that and appreciating that. You know, not everybody has got computers and not everybody's got cell phones, but an awful lot of children today are sitting looking at their cell phones and not seeing the unbelievable beauty and light and wonder that's in this city that we live in. So as teachers, it's a challenge for you and I don't think it's an easy challenge, but I'm hoping that with some ideas that we can, ch we can explore today, that you will get ideas of how you can encourage this next generation of young people to really appreciate the wonderful city that we live in and all the amazing things around us. You know, when I wake up in the morning and I look out and I just look at the sky, we've got this beautiful clear sky. Sometimes it's cloudy, beautiful light. When we were in Chile, we, um, we'd been for a week in Santiago and I knew the Andes were there, but I had never seen them. And then on Sunday, I looked out of the hotel window and there were the Andes. There'd been so much pollution in the area that you could not see those beautiful mountains. And we complain about the wind in Cape Town, but it blows the pollution away. <laughs> and we can see our mountains and we've got fairly good clean air most of the time. So I'm just trying to encourage you to really appreciate this wonderful place that we live in and to be inspired. I know it's difficult being a teacher with big classes and trying to meet the curriculum and all those sort of things. But just remember that you can inspire a child and change their lives and not even realize that you're doing it. Um, this little book, uh, how do I go on from here? Right in. Oh, okay, what I'm going to do is give you an idea. Um, George and I were involved when they were planning Two Oceans Aquarium. And then just before the aquarium opened, we were trying to decide how we were going to get people to come to the aquarium and how we were going to get um, <coughs> classes involved. And three teachers, uh, art teachers, linked together with me and we put together a big mural that was, was about five meters across and about two meters high. And the, we got in about a hundred kids from several different schools and it was, we worked over about a three day period. And this is the, the west coast side of it. You can see the map of Africa, of Southern Africa up there. And the teachers had wonderful ideas of how we could show that silver fish coming down on the west coast. We could show the kelp forests, the islands with penguins on it, some of the fishing ships and things. And all these different activities, each child made a fish. Um, how did we go on? This was a good idea that one of the teachers had where you cut out the shapes of the fish with cardboard and then covered them with tin foil and you could scrape in or press in the shapes of all the eyes and the, the scales and things like that. And then if you use a little bit of um, polish over the top, uh, um, you could improve the effect of it. So this was the one group, they made all the silver fish and one group made 
the kelp with the, we had material that was used to make the kelp and the birds and the ships were actually made with um, matches and things like that. And then on the other side was the east coast as, as a contrast. And <clears throat> you can see here all the colourful fish that the, I met one of the teachers. Now this must be what over 30 years ago. I met one of the teachers who was doing this and she said she felt so lucky she got the group that was doing the tropical fish. <laughs> but here there are quite a lot of different techniques used here. There was, they used, you can see, um, where is this? Point is at a little red bar, just above the back and forth. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can see this um, fish here, for example, they painted it with black and then they bleached out the shapes and the patterns. Here's another one down there that was, was painted and, and the, the colours were bleached out. And then the, the sardine run was actually done with potato printing, you know, where they made potato cuts and then printed all the sardines with that. There were little crabs made. We had real sand that was um, placed along the edge of the coast. And we also painted the sea a different colour on the Oh dear. On the west coast it was slightly more turquoise coloured. You can see the currents coming up the Benguela current and you can see it was more turquoise because of the stuff in the plankton, the plankton in the water, whereas on the right side it was a deeper blue because it was more transparent. When we were doing this, we had no idea what was going to be in these tanks in the aquarium. We, we, hoped, we had what they, we hoped was going to be there, but we didn't know what was going to be there. So it was all a, a, a very exciting kind of experiment with the kids and with us. And I remember the night that we um, finally finished the exhibit. This is one of the, the fish that was, was painted. The night that we finished the exhibit and we put it up in the aquarium it was already dark and we turned on the light and it was so exciting to see these fish shining and so on. And this is the kind of experiment that you could actually do in a school where you combine your art teachers, your geography teachers and your science teachers in a, in a combined activity to make something special that the children really can get involved with. And you know, when I go back to the aquarium today and I see how much growth there's been, we used to run um, workshops for volunteers to begin with. We trained 300 volunteers to, so that they would be able to take people around the aquarium and explain what was happening at the exhibits. And it was a wonderful group of people because they had all sorts of talents. And I used to say, well, you know, what will you do if you if you're going to make it more interesting and a whole lot of them were musicians and they played music in front of the one tank and a whole lot of them were actors and one of the girls who was very good at acting became one of the um, people doing the puppet show at the aquarium and Anton up there was one of our volunteers and he got a job at the museum and has been working here ever since. So it was a very exciting group of people. They were volunteers, they weren't paid but they had quite a comprehensive course to learn what was going on in the aquarium. And one of the courses that we decided to do was for biology teachers, natural science I think you call it, <laughs> but, um, and we brought them in on the condition that they would take their own classes through the aquarium and explain the exhibits <coughs> to their own classes, but they would give us five sessions where they would take the public through and explain what was going on in the, uh, the aquarium. And it was very well supported. And out of that, four of those teachers decided to come and work at the <coughs> aquarium. And some of those teachers have actually been the ones who have initiated the, um, this new marine curriculum for, for matric. So it's been, it, it's been a wonderful environment to work in. And it's, um, it's full of opportunities. And it's very easy to make people excited when they see the beauty of nature. And um, what I thought that we could do as a group 
is break into small groups where you can take, in, in my little book, I've got almost every spread could be potentially a lesson. You know, there's one on the, the sandy <laughs> shore, there's one on the rocky shore, there's one on tropical fish, there's one on the kelp forest. You could take a spread like that and there's basic information, the, the groundwork that's needed to, to get across and then there's suggestions for how you can expand it. Suggestions you could give kids to do projects where they could choose one animal and research it themselves and that sort of thing. So, and the, the book has been used, it's been around for quite a long time, it's gone through three different designs and um, I, you know, I meet teachers with the original old little book and they say, I'm still using my book. Mm -hmm. So it does work. And I mean, it, it works because we're in such a beautiful environment. We <coughs> just need to make use of it. So what we're going to do, um, I can't remember what, uh, what we're going to do is explore four topics from the book. And I suggest that, um, you know, if you take children to the beach, you have to be careful. It's a dangerous place. I was very sad to see in the news just the other day a mother saying, and you know my daughter never went into the sea and yet she drowned in the sea. And I felt how sad, you know. It's, it's so important not to keep out of the sea but to learn to respect the sea, to learn to understand the ocean to know that you get a high tide and a low tide, that you get strong waves, that you get currents. Mm. And, you, and when we used to go down to the trans sky in those early days, my aunt was a teacher and before we went into the water, we'd stand up on the high banks and we'd look down at the waves and we'd see where the rip currents were going out and we'd, we'd choose where we were going to swim away from the rip currents and things like that. We need to teach our kids to be safe when they go to the sea. And, um, you know, when I first arrived in Cape Town, the drownings were horrific. There used to be as many drownings as there were car deaths. And I, it has improved because there's been quite a lot of um, work done to teach beachcraft and to teach people to swim and to have lifeguards at the beach and all those sort of things. But it's better for people to be informed than to keep them away from danger. Rather know what the danger is and know how to be safe there. But what I uh, suggest is that for the younger children, it's safer to take them to the sandy shore and to work with the, the, the um, thing on shells is one that you can actually do in the classroom. And, and at the beach, you know, you can do either. You don't have to take a group to the beach. It's difficult to take a big group to the beach and you need to have <coughs> enough adults with you to, to, be, to keep an eye on them all. But it's, it's a wonderful experience. The um, more senior ones, the rocky shore, um, it's wonderful to go onto a rocky shore, but you do need to choose a rocky shore that's safe. You need to choose, make sure that you Choose low spring tide. Do you all know about tides? Because people phone us and they say, oh, won't you take our group to the beach? And I say, what date? And uh, I find out the date and I immediately Google and I look at the tides. Not a spring tide won't take you. Only take people to a rocky shore outing when it's spring tide and not at high tide, at low spring tide. And we're lucky in this city because our low spring, lowest spring tides are usually bet about between 9 and 11, the days when you get the lowest spring tides, it's at 9 to 11. When we were working in the States, we, uh, <laughs> they don't have uh, two, two tides like, you know, we, they have a very low tide in, was it in winter? 
when in winter the very low tide was in the middle of the night and then they had a moderately <coughs> low tide in the day so we had to do our experiments we'd go out <laughs> in the middle of the night with all our torches and lights putting up our experiments and things Keep the snow off the shore and then we had we had cages to to keep various animals out and you know we were doing all these experiments and then came along summer and the whole thing flipped and they had the very low tide in the middle of the day and of course it was then hot, so all our things were sitting high and dried, all the animals died, they were <laughs> bleached by the sun and so on. So it was more difficult to work there. But here we have two pretty equal tides each day. day. So we get a low tide at spring tide. When the moon is full and new, you can always go out. I look at full moon, oh, let's go down to the beach at such and such a time. Full moon and new moon, the very low tides on the middle of the morning, which is perfect. And uh, so you do need to plan carefully if you're going to take people to the beach. The other thing is on the rocky shore, you need to find a safe beach and you need to be wearing shoes that don't slip. You know, George and I took a, a group of elderly people to the beach down at Molly Point there. And we were a bit nervous. We hadn't chosen the site ourselves. And we, we'd only been on the beach about 10 minutes and one lady just went <laughs> down, plop into a pool, you know. And um, so then I took the less able group along the beach and we walked along the sandy shore and George took the energetic ones out <laughs> onto the rocks. But it is potentially risky, but it's fun. So you need to be prepared and you need to know what you, you're doing. Sensible shoes that can get wet if you're going onto the rocky shore. And then of course, see the, nowadays there are all the exciting people who snorkel and wear wetsuits and, and surf and things like that. So there's that next group of, of older kids who are comfortable in the water and there are lots of opportunities for gaining those skills. So it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful environment to work in. And I do challenge you to make the most of it, to try and introduce your classes and your youngsters to something really special. And both the aquarium and the um, museum have the, the um, what do you call it, where you go out to the schools with your um, truck, your outreach your mobile, mobile outreach. That's a wonderful way of starting the, the exercise. And you know, <coughs> even, even when you're living on the Cape Flats, there are now good places where you can go down and you can experience the sea. Um, we were involved in Monwabisi, for example, when they were setting up all the um, environmental um, protection there and putting up all the posters and and so on so there are lots of nice places I mean we love going to Musenberg it's it's easy to get to this public transport to Musenberg and every time you walk along the beach it's different you know it's as you can go at high and low tide if there's been a wind all sorts of wonderful things have been washed in even the kelp that's lying on the beach you know, some people say, oh, the smelly kelp, we don't want to go to Komiki because of the smelly kelp. But if you lift up the smelly kelp, there are all sorts of little hohos crawling around under the kelp. And they're actually the clean-up gang. That's what's cleaning up the, the, the kelp. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, I think we'll have eight groups of about eight people and each one each group will have one of these topics to to um, discuss I've got a few ideas for you you can discuss a typical lesson you can discuss an unusual lesson it might be drama or poetry or different language or something and then um, when we get to the aquarium we won't feed back at this stage we'll just brainstorm ideas and you're all coming from different experiences and you can share what you, how you think you can use this information. And then when we get to the aquarium, 
We'll walk through the aquarium and you'll see some of the living exhibits. Uh, the first section is the, um, the east coast where there'll be some of the tropical stuff. And then we'll end up at the um, kelp forest tank where Bianca will um, explain the ecosystem there. And then we're going to go to the classrooms. Now, group two will go to the upstairs classroom and feed back on what they've done with me. And group one will go to the bottom classroom and they will do a kelp hold fast. And then after 45 minutes, we'll swap. So that's just so because the group's a bit too big for the classrooms there. So I hope it's all going to work all right, but uh, I know you all a very enthusiastic, experienced group of, of um, people and I encourage you to share what you know, to learn from one another and see how you can use this wonderful environment that we live in. So this is just explaining what will happen when we get to the, to the aquarium. So I don't, haven't quite worked out how to, uh, <laughs> how to break you into the groups. Um, Margaret, we, yes. we first have a coffee break. Yes. And once they have their coffee, they will, you know, have <laughs> many ideas. <laughs> yes, yes. 